We want to begin this morning by welcoming you, welcoming you to this memorial service in honor of our beloved sister and friend, Ruth Samuelson. On behalf of the Samuelson family and the many other families represented here, we're so glad you're with us today for this special occasion. We gather here for a number of reasons this afternoon. One reason, of course, is that we gather to mourn and grieve the loss of a mother, a wife, a friend, a community leader. And it's appropriate to mourn. It's appropriate to grieve and to grieve together as a body. We loved Ruth and we will miss her. We also gather today for another reason, and that is to celebrate. We not only come as mourners, we come also as celebrators, those who rejoice, those who give thanks, those who celebrate the life of Ruth Samuelson and the blessing she was to so many of us, to rejoice in how God used her, how he worked through her, and how she touched the lives of so many people. But most of all this, this afternoon, we gather to worship. I know that sounds strange, in fact, in many ways, even paradoxical on a day like this to come together and worship. But in the Bible, there is a rich history of God's people gathering to worship on just such occasions. In fact, when King David lost his baby son and learned of the death of his child, the text tells us he went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. We worship today because Jesus is still Lord and he is still king, and he is still a good, gracious, and wise God. So hear now this call to worship from Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, we do come to you now with heavy hearts, grieving hearts. We grieve over the loss of our dear sister Ruth. We ask for your comfort. You tell us and you promise us in your word that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, saves the crushed in spirit. And in many ways we're crushed, Lord, the sad to miss our dear friend. Pour out your spirit on us, comfort us during this time. We take comfort in your sovereignty today, Lord, that you are the wise God and you do all things well. We know that not a sparrow falls from the sky, not a hair is lost on our head without your providential care. And we trust even these things, even death, into your hands. But Lord, we most of all take comfort today in the finished work of Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ told us that I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me shall live even though he dies. And today we claim that, Lord, and we believe it more than ever. We know you've conquered death. We know that our dear sister Ruth trusted you fully and is now with you alive in full joy and peace. And Lord, we know that one day you will put all things right, including death. We know that one day you will finally fix this fallen, broken world. And so as we gather for worship today, we long for that day. We anticipate the great inbreaking of your son when he will come and put all things right. And we will be alive again with resurrected bodies and we will see our sister Ruth again. Lord, we know that you know what death is like. You entered a world filled with it. You went to funerals, you wept. Lord, you died, you rose again. And Lord, we, may we look to you as the ultimate comfort today that death has been beaten, it's been conquered, and Lord, that you reign victorious. And we pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom God sent to conquer death, and he conquered it. Amen. Please stand with me and let's sing together. The songs that we'll do in this service are songs that Ruth uh, picked out long ago. Um, so many of you know that. But let's sing together. Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Oh, my soul prays for you. 
Ruth Samuelson loved the Word of God, fed on it daily. It was her sustenance. We have a number of scripture readings today, and we begin with John 11. John 11, verses 20 to 27. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask for, from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. This next verse, Matthew 6, verse 33, was Ruth's life verse. It says this, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The homily today will be on Matthew 25, which speaks of... Uh, well done, good and faithful servant. That was Ruth's goal to, when she reached her finish line of life, to hear those words. And Ruth said it was Psalm 46, verse 10, which is how God directed her and how to achieve that end. Psalm 46, verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now, Hear the reading of Psalm 23. This was Ruth's confidence in life and in death, and this is our confidence today. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Join me as we approach the throne of grace and pray to the God of mercy and pray to the God of comfort. Let's pray. Father of mercy and grace, we call upon you this day to be present by your Holy Spirit. For your, your word promises that you are near to the brokenhearted, and Father, we come today brokenhearted. We come today to cast our cares upon you and seek the strength and comfort that only you can give. Let us find comfort in the certainty of your sovereign will. As we mourn the loss of our friend Ruth, 
we rejoice, knowing that she was a child of God. She was your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which you prepared beforehand. Lord, we take comfort knowing that the work you prepared for her to do is completed. Thank you for displaying your glory through her life and kindly bringing her home to be with you in heaven for all eternity, to receive the glorious inheritance that belongs to anyone united to Christ, the reward that she so excitedly anticipated, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Lord, we are so thankful that her suffering is no more. The cancer that sought to destroy her has no effect. Death has lost its sting. She has been made perfect in holiness. The joy of heaven and the splendor of, her, of your presence are hers to enjoy forever. But we mourn, Lord Jesus, because we miss her. Jesus, pour out your compassion on the Samuelson family. You know the pain of loss and the deep hurt we feel. You wept at the grave of Lazarus and comforted his friends and comforted his family. And we ask that you would give us that same compassion. Give Ken that same compassion for the family and for their friends. Holy Spirit, you are the great comforter. Romans tells us that it is you that helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Holy Spirit, transform this grief that seems so heavy into the peaceable fruit of righteousness by drawing us into a deeper fellowship with you, that we may not set our affections on the things of this world, but upon our true home in heaven, where all who have departed in Christ await and are far beyond the shadow of death. Lord, we long for the day when you will make all things new, when we are gathered with the saints and you will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things will have passed away. Mm -hmm. And until that day comes, Lord, give us the grace to cling to you and to dwell in the shelter of the Most High and to abide in the shadow of the Almighty, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Mm -hmm. And now we pray as you taught us to pray, saying these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So 
next scripture is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a word of encouragement for us all. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our next reading is from John, the 14th chapter, where our Lord Jesus Christ himself assures us, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand and sing with us, my Jesus, I love thee. I 
My name is Dave Culp. I'm one of the pastors at Uptown Church. It's, an, it's been a privilege to get to know Ken and Ruth over the 12 years that I've been at Uptown, and it's been a real joy to walk through life with them in small groups and Sunday school and church worship. It's now a real honor to share about the life of such an amazing woman who is a gift to many. She's now, I'm confident, she's now in heaven, and it's, but she's lived a lot of life here on earth and blessed so many. Recently, in a Caring Bridge post, Ken opened up and said, you know, Ruth has limited time where she's going to have clear thinking. And so if anyone wants to share goodbye wishes or stories or any words that you want to send off to Ruth, you can post them in the comments below. Last time I checked, there were over 600 comments. One of the things that I think that's so beautiful about that is that so many in this room could stand in this place and eulogize Ruth. We all have stories. We've all been touched in different ways. She made such an impact wherever she went. As I read through those comments and as I thought through the life of Ruth Samuelson, I thought of three themes. Ruth was a capable servant. Ruth was bold and loving. And Ruth lived a life that was marked by faith. Ruth Samuelson was a capable servant. Whether it was homeschooling her children, teaching a beloved third grader to read at Eastover Elementary, rewiring her own kitchen so well that an electrician offered her a job, true story, or whipping votes in the North Carolina State House, Ruth Samuelson was a capable woman. Ruth Samuelson was also bold and loving. On Caring Bridge, there were countless stories that people shared of this bold love that Ruth lived with on a daily basis, whether it was something really big that she believed in, like Little Sugar Creek Greenway, or defending the, the rights of the unborn, or whether it was just a personal conversation that she really felt led to have with someone. She got right to the point, and it was always grounded in love. Ruth displayed this loving tenacity in her parenting, her marriage, her friendships, her work, and with pretty much any person she came across. Ruth Samuelson was a bold and loving woman. Third, Ruth Samuelson's life was marked by faith. As many of you know, Ruth loved the Word of God. She had so many Bible verses memorized. In fact, 650 Bible verses that she had memorized in her head that would flow from her in Sunday school, in small groups, in conversations. She fed deeply on the Word of God. That marked her life. And if you know Ruth well, it doesn't come as a very big surprise that Ruth planned her own funeral. On her phone, she had on Evernote a list that she would add to constantly. Here are the scriptures that I want read. Here are the songs that I want to sing. And here's the point that we're trying to make. And as when I met with Ken and our senior pastor, Tom Hawks, to plan this service, a part of that was she said, and I want you to read this article and keep it in mind as you plan my service. And the title of that article was, Please Do Not Make My Funeral All About me. Ruth's life was not all about her. Ruth's life pointed to someone much greater than her. Her life pointed to her Savior, Jesus Christ. Ruth lived out a vibrant faith that was so evident for so many to see that whether you agreed with her or you didn't, you were drawn to it. Those close to Ruth would really see that her life was marked by faith. That's what so many have said. Recently, I was at the Samuelson house and I was sitting with Ken and on his iPad, he was flipping through these pictures of Ruth and his constant refrain, no matter what age she was, wouldn't he, he said, isn't she beautiful? Isn't she beautiful? Isn't she beautiful? And I said, you know, Ken, one of the most beautiful times in all of Ruth's life was this last season. I said it was beautiful because she lived the exact same way that she had lived up to that point. She lived in a way that showed her faith. She was confident in where she was going. She loved others and she constantly pointed others to God. In my final conversation with Ruth after she was released from her last hospital visit, I went over to the house and in a moment of clarity, she sat down and she said, I'm glad you're here. I want, you to, I want to tell you about all the people I was able to share my faith with in the hospital. 
Her faithfulness went wherever she went. She cared for people and pointed them to Christ when they entered in to visit in their last days. She cared for people and pointed them to Christ in every Caring Bridge post that left people saying, how is this faith so strong? In these last few months, Ruth didn't give up on anything. She continued to come to our church's small group, our Bible study that meets on Tuesday nights, and she was there week after week. And as we were teaching through the Psalms, Ruth would inevitably have something to share. And when she had something to share, I could see the whole group just lean in and listen to what Ruth had to say. And I don't think it was just our small group. I think it was everyone that knew her. They leaned in. They paid attention to every word. They listened to what she had to, stay, to say. And in this time, her faith was shining. Ruth didn't want her funeral to be all about herself. She wanted her life and her death to point others to her Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're a believer in Jesus, I pray that as you lean in, as you reflect on the life of Ruth Samuelson, that your faith is encouraged that you would understand that you are better prepared to face death because you saw a faithful servant walk it to the end. If you're not a believer, I pray that you would lean in, that you would consider the life of Ruth Samuelson. I ask you to consider one of the many verses Ruth had memorized, John 14, 6, which says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This was Ruth's firm belief that those with faith in Jesus will never die because he is the savior that was sent to pay for Ruth's sins and for our sins. And I trust that Ruth would want nothing else than in her funeral to have you consider where your security lies, where your hope lies, because Ruth faced death with real security because it was not in her own power, although she was a very capable, bold, loving woman. Her trust was in a savior, a savior that was bringing her home. I trust that Ruth would be exceedingly joyful to know that even through this tragic event, God was bringing his people into his kingdom. I pray that you would lean in and consider the life and the faith of Ruth Samuelson. I pray that God will enable all of us to lean in and pay attention and to consider the many lessons that Ruth Samuelson taught us. I'll now invite Connus Dyer, a family friend, to come up and share her eulogy. 30 years. Seems like a long time, but it just seems like yesterday. Ruth and I first met when we were in our mid-twenties. I know it seems like I couldn't possibly be that old, but um, we each had a baby and a toddler. We went to the same church. We lived near each other. And when our mutual friend, Cindy Stack, introduced us, we had no idea the wonderful years as friends that awaited us or the hard things that we would help each other through. Ruth and I found out pretty quickly that we were very different. She was an extrovert, I was an introvert. She liked wearing overalls, I did not. <laughs> I liked to cook and bake, she did not. She used power tools, I did not. <laughs> and yet, we were friends. And although if it had been up to Ruth, that may never have happened, because I discovered several years after we had become friends, unknown to me, that Ruth had thought when she first met me that we couldn't really be friends. Um, she um, wasn't sure that she could really like me. I think my love of bows and pearls was too much for her. She told me, she said, you know, I thought you, you're not what I thought you'd be. You're very different than I expected. She said, but you're okay. <laughs> she said, I'm glad we are friends. And that was our friendship in a nutshell. After several years of friendship, as couples and as families, the Dyers and the Samuelsons, we felt as if God had brought our two families together. And we sort of unofficially committed to being in each other's lives. And we have been for these past 30 years, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Even though Ruth isn't physically present with us, that commitment between the Dyers and the Samuelsons remains in effect. 
as I have reflected over these past 30 years, and specifically my friendship with Ruth, and as I've started grieving the loss of her physical presence, I've been overwhelmed with gratitude. Ken and Ruth, Bobby and David and Joy and Alex have been to us, the Dyers, a blessing and one of God's great good provisions to us as we have tried to walk this journey of life by faith. I am so thankful for having Ruth in my life as my friend. She was God's good provision to me. And I know for so many of you, she was God's good blessing and gift to you also. You know, right after Ruth got her first Prius, she needed to go to DC for a conference. She said, why don't you go with me? She said, um, you can go to the seminars that I can't get to and you can take notes for me. <laughs> she said, we can try out the Prius and see what it can really do. And I thought, no, that's not gonna be much. <laughs> we stopped, we stopped about halfway there and in classic Ruth fashion, she said, you drive now and I'll tell you where to go. <laughs> so I drove and I was a pretty good chauffeur until we reached DuPont Circle in DC late that night. We took a few spins around DuPont, unsure of how to exit the infamous circle. However, when we did finally emerge, we ran a red light. And the scene that followed was something out of a Thelma and Louise movie. <laughs> Not sure who was at fault or why we ran the red light or if anyone saw us, but glad we had escaped. And we laughed to let, you know, hysterically all the way to the hotel. We really were two smart women, but we were also very, every now and then, just two blondes trying to get off of DuPont Circle. <laughs> I could tell you so many stories like, like this, like the time she went with me to a race event knowing Tony Stewart would be there. She was pretty pumped about meeting her man, Tony. She was introduced to him, and as the evening wore on, I kind of, kind of, you know, needled her a little bit. I said, you should go and ask Tony to dance. I was kind of teasing, you know, but um, wondering if she really would take me up on it. And uh, she did. <laughs> she thought it was a good idea, so she proceeded to walk over to Tony and asked him to dance. He smiled, he got a little flustered, and he said, I don't dance, but thank you very much. <laughs> and then, in classic Ruth fashion, she turned, and as she walked away, she said, you'll be sorry. <laughs> Just like Ruth, the perfect mix of fun and depth. At some point, while we were both homeschooling about 18 years ago, Ruth said to me, I feel like God is going to ask me to do something, and I need to get prepared. And so she did. She started by memorizing scripture. She got started, and she became a memory machine. Fast forward, and she eventually, as Dave said, memorized over 600 different verses. But she didn't just memorize them. She meditated on them, thought through them, and would call them to mind. You might wonder why this was Ruth's preparation plan, but she believed that God's word was how God revealed himself to us. Ruth knew that studying and knowing God's word is how we know God and how he speaks to us. One of the verses Ruth memorized was Hebrews 4.12, that the word of God is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Ruth believed that God's word had the power and the ability to change her and make her more like Christ. God used Ruth's journey of scripture memorization to not only show her how to support and love her husband and her children, it also prepared her to answer the call to serve her community, her city, and her state. This was the preparation that cultivated courage and gave her the discernment to speak truth. Being able to recall all the ways that God knew her, loved her, and fought for her gave her the strength to be kind and the freedom to not defend herself. The Lord was in control and would give her exactly what she needed in his good time. I can't get my fingers to work. And so slowly, bit by bit, 
Ruth traded in what she wanted for what God wanted. And God's word changed her. It made her more like him. And because of that, we all were changed and impacted by knowing and loving Ruth. As I've thought so much about how I could honor my dear friend today and also honor the God we both loved, I believe it's this. Ruth would want you to leave here not focusing on her and her life, but on the God she loved. She wanted us all to know how good he is and how he can and does change us through a personal relationship with him and through his word. One of the ways I thought of that you and I can honor Ruth and continue her legacy, what she would be so excited about is for you and I to find ways to get more of God's word into our hearts and our souls. Maybe we start with a memory, maybe you start with a memory program like Ruth did. Maybe you listen to scripture um, on your phone um, audio, by audio. Maybe you sing it, in a, sing it in song, you read it. Just find ways to get more of God's word into your heart. It not only gave Ruth the strength and wisdom to walk the path that God called her as a wife and a mom and a friend, a sister and a daughter, but it also enabled her to finish well. The last few days as Ruth began to fade, I was reading some of her memory verse cards to her, and I saved two of her cards. And I was, as I was reading, Ruth was kind of in and out, and I started reading Philippians 3, 20 through 21. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And as I read the last part about our lowly bodies being transformed to be like Jesus's glorious body, Ruth opened her eyes, she looked over at me, she smiled, and she said, and that's a good thing. And I said, yes, Ruth, that's a very good thing. And then she closed her eyes and drifted off to sleep. And as I continued to read verses, I came across one that completely stopped me. It was 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. Train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. All the years, and I realized all the years of scripture memory and studying of God's word, Ruth's training in godliness wasn't just for great good in this life, but it was what God used to prepare Ruth to finish well. To finish this life with grace and strength without fear. The Lord not only used it to prepare her and help her finish well in this life, but he used it to prepare her for the life to come. That was part of that training, not just to end here, but to prepare her for the life to come, the life she is experiencing now. Because you see, Ruth no longer needs to memorize scripture, as she is in the very presence of Jesus, the living and eternal word. In these last weeks, there was an undeniable feeling of peace around Ruth, and actually in the whole house. That feeling of peace drew me in. Being with Ruth had almost a holy feeling to it. And that peace was truly the power and presence of God. So now, here we are today, celebrating the finished plan, the work that God had ordained for her eons ago. Her life was a tapestry, and there was no string left undone. There was no knot untied. Nothing was unfinished. The work, of, the work that God began in my sweet friend Ruth is done. It's finished. But all of us who have loved her and have been impacted by her have had a glimpse of this glorious unfolding in the life of Ruth, a story that God has written. And her story is now a part of my story and your story. I want to finish with this scripture from Colossians that I think is a perfect tribute to dear Ruth. And before I finish reading it, I just want to say that I love you, Ruth, and I'm so going to miss being an old lady with you. And this is Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you almost must forgive. 
and above all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thank you, Connors. I'll now invite up the Samuelson children. Bobby will be the spokesperson. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Connors. That was really beautiful. I do feel like I need to defend the Prius, though. Um, so after Mom bought that, David and I were driving on I-85 and got it over 100 miles an hour. Do not tell the state troopers, Governor Cooper. Uh, so can do something, I guess. And David still drives one, so it must be great. Um, so um, so uh, thank you all for coming. This is... Um, <laughs> I actually looked back a few minutes ago and got choked up just seeing everybody here. It's really incredible. Um, you guys have been such a gift to us in this hard time. The comments on Caring Bridge have been amazing. And um, the coolest thing about it is that, you know, we see her as a mother and as a mom, and that's a particular perspective. And um, everything on Caring Bridge and just all, like, all the love that you guys have poured out towards us has showed us a, a new light on her. And David and I were talking about this earlier today. Um, it's given us an entirely new perspective on our mother, who we thought we knew so well. But each of your different stories and, and different um, conversations you've had with her over time just blessed us intensely. And so I just wanted to thank you all for being here. Thank you for the gifts you've given us through this, uh, through this time. So I'm Bobby. Uh, I'm the oldest. My brother David is right there, along with Joy and Alex. Uh, and again, thank you just so much for being here. And I'm going to speak on behalf of the kids today. Um, so, so as we were kind of thinking about how to do this, I, as, as people have already noted, you know, mom memorized a lot of scripture. And so I thought, is there a scripture verse that might actually encapsulate how uh, she parented and how she was at a mo as a mom? And the one I found was Proverbs 22.6, which says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And what struck me about this verse is there are actually two distinct parts to the verse. There's train up a child in the way he should go. And then, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And as I thought about how mom parented and built her relationship with us, uh, I actually saw that, that actually bear out here in this verse, in, in this verse two clear parts. Um, so I want to kind of walk through that and, and tell you a little bit about what it was like growing up uh, with mom and, uh, and being homeschooled by her in that first section of the verse here, train up a child in the way he should go. So as I was thinking about this, you know, this happens implicitly and explicitly. And early on in life, you know, a lot of what we learn about our parents, we see implicitly just watching them. And as, you know, again, people noted and the observer noted, mom really liked wearing bib overalls. So, uh, so what that showed us implicitly is, is mom didn't dress like other women. And as Dave noted, uh, <laughs> She liked to, you know, wire things in the house. I'll actually never forget the time that I saw her pulling on a pair of boots at our house on Huntington Park Drive, and I said, Mom, what are you doing with boots? And she goes, oh, I have to go wade into the septic tank. And I was like, <laughs> what? So uh, the, other thing I, the other funny thing I remember about her outfits was I remember she had these, these really horrible pair of acid wash jeans. And I kept asking, one day I asked her, I said, why are you wearing acid wash jeans? Like, n no one does that anymore, apparently. And, um, and she had said, well, it's because if I spill paint, no one will notice the paint on the jeans. And I said, but mom, are, are you painting today? And she said, no, but you never know when, you know. <laughs> so, so, you know, we immediately knew that mom just didn't look like other moms. She just wasn't like a normal, you know, mom type character. Um, so we, we learned a lot from that. Uh, secondly, mom didn't act like a normal mom in a lot of ways. Um, so there's a really funny story about David growing up. David broke his arm, and first of all, mom waited a day to take him to the emergency room. <laughs> and, uh, and, when he, and when we got there, um, the physician said, well, look, we're gonna have to set the arm and do the cast and everything. And mom said, well, yeah, but he's going on a ski trip next week. And the doctor was like, no, he's not. And, and mom said, well, okay, so let me get this straight. So you, he, you know, he broke it, you're gonna set it. Let's say that he just went back out and broke it again, then what would happen? He said, well, then we'd have to set it again. And she goes, well, that doesn't sound that bad. So, <laughs> so lo and behold, David went on the ski trip and uh, nothing happened, it was great. Um, so, so that's what we saw. Uh, the other thing that I think became apparent to us as kids was mom and dad's relationship was really special and really, um, God, this is where I'm going to start crying. This is, uh, it was a really unique thing, and um, they modeled this incredible Christ-centered marriage. And, um, and, you know, I just remember things as a kid where, like, dad would pull mom into the closet and shut the door and be like, don't come in here, and they'd be kissing and stuff. And, you know, we thought that was gross, but really it was awesome. And, and 
you know, thinking back on it, obviously. And so we, so we saw this relationship play out, and my parents also gave us the gift of having open conflict in the house. I remember, um, you can imagine what their disagreements were like, you guys all knowing my mom. And so they'd be in there disagreeing with something, and the, and the kids would all sit around the kitchen table and sort of observe this occur. And what we saw was actually a loving, Christ-centered Christian marriage play out in the landscape of conflict. And that's an incredible gift to give us as really even young kids watching that happen. Um, the other thing is, you know, as we watched mom over time, we implicitly figured out what was important to mom. And there became a very clear hierarchy that showed up over time. And it went something like this. You know, God is most important. Dad is second most important. The kids are third most important. Then comes church. And then comes pretty much anyone in need. Uh, there was actually a guy last night who came through during the visitation hours who was literally, he started to tear up talking to me. He barely even knew my mom, but apparently his house had burned down at Rotary. My mom grabbed him afterwards and like hooked him up with all the city officials and got everything sorted out. And he just, he couldn't help himself crying in front of me about my mom helping him out just in that, in that moment. Um, so that was my mom's hierarchy. We also learned pretty early on that there are certain things my mom did not value and that those things that my mom did not value didn't line up with kind of cultural norms. Mom pretty clearly never valued money, status, power, or visibility. And what's been so interesting to watch as people sort of talk about her life and the Observer writes the articles and all sorts of stuff is you could look at her life and say, well, she must have valued all those things because she got all those things. But that was never what she valued. What she valued was God, dad, us, the church, and those in need. And that's a beautiful... Uh, Man, it just hits you. Um, that's a beautiful thing. Okay, David is my backup if I can't hold it together, by the way. <laughs> so, all right, so homeschooling. Um, I just wanna share a couple words about homeschooling because that was, that was awesome. Um, she did that for me. I, I was never really made for, for normal school and so mom pulled me out of school and, and, um, and homeschooled me. And you know, so many people talk about her creativity and her intelligence and her vibrancy and her spunk and all this sort of stuff that mom was. And when you read the Observer article, it kind of looks like she was selling insurance and then right in, went right into politics. There was actually 15 years of a gap there. Uh, and, and most of that 15 years, she spent homeschooling us. And so we spent all day, every day with her. And that was an incredible experience. And she, she did these incredible things uh, teaching us that, that were uh, just so mom, like we were learning about photons and she made this thing called the photon dance. Uh, I'm not gonna do it, but it, you know, it was this, it was this great way to learn what a photon does. Um, she had, I remember we were learning about the medieval ages and she actually hired this like medieval troop to show up at our house and um, got neighborhood kids made fun of me about that one. But um, so, so there's just all these incredible things. Uh, one really funny story, I guess this kind of relates to physics is, um, you know, my, my brother and his best friend Nielsen, who's probably here, uh, ordered a water balloon launcher online. And, and whereas most parents would be like, you know, you're not allowed to have a water balloon launcher, um, Nielsen and David were out testing it in the front yard and mom came out and she said, well, listen, here's the problem, okay? The cord is too short and the elasticity isn't right, okay? So I'm gonna take you to the medical supply store and actually buy you surgical tubing that's gonna make that a lot more accurate and shoot a lot further. <laughs> so, and, and it was definitely the most accurate and long distance water balloon launcher in Charlotte for a long period of time. Uh, so I apologize if we hit any of your cars, but anyway. Um, the other thing I remember that, that's just so dear to my heart is my mom, you know, this, this, this is so shocking because she said so many great things in her life, but there were these quiet moments where mom would just take time to be with us. And the thing that she loved to do to be with us really more than anything else was read to us. And I just remember as a kid um, sitting on the back porch for hours and she would just read these books to us, Chronicles of Narnia all the way through. And I had these incredible memories of these like beautiful, I think, I guess spring days where we would just sit with our heads in her laps in her, in her lap while she would just read these books to us. And it just, I don't know, gave us a real love of reading and, and a love of mom too. So, so that was what it was like growing up. Again, kind of trained up a child on the way he should go. That was that phase. That phase kind of ended when she got into politics and, uh, and we were okay with that. We were really proud of her. She was gone a lot more though. And so we kind of transitioned to the second part of the verse. Um, which is, you know, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so mom's attitude sort of shifted. And she essentially said, look, you know, we spent a lot of time together, 15 years training up you guys. Now it's time for you guys to kind of go be adults as high schoolers. And um, <laughs> so that came with some, some, some pitfalls. We didn't have curfews, which we abused, you know, sometimes. But at the end of the day, what it, what it really showed us was that mom was for us. Mom and dad were both, they were for us all the time, whether we succeeded whether we failed, no matter what happened to us, you know, they fundamentally trusted uh, us to God. 
not to themselves, but to God. My dad has a saying, responsible to, not responsible for. And so he says, look, you know, we are gonna let you be autonomous, we're gonna let you learn, let you grow, but always knew that mom loved us. And it was so great through high school because that foundation kind of carried us forward in our relationship with her over the years as we went to college, as we built families, as we had kids. That, found, that uh, relationship we had with her, that foundation was built in high school where she really just said, look, I'm just here for you no matter what happens to you, no matter what, and that's a, that's a really a beautiful thing. So, so as I think about you know, um, all the roles that she played as a result, you know, we, we always viewed mom as a mentor, and I know a lot of you guys did too. People came through visitation last night and said things like, you know, your parents saved my marriage and stuff like that. And, and I, I, we saw the same thing. Mom was our mentor, mom was our counselor, mom was our spiritual advisor, mom was our truth teller. All right? A lot of times we didn't want to hear it, but mom would tell us the truth no matter what. Um, but more than anything else, mom was a model of Christ in action and a life lived for Jesus. And she, that's the most consistent thing about her all the way through. But again, as she laid this foundation to let us really be, to some degree, peers of hers and to understand her as a person uh, from high school and beyond, we really came to appreciate that in her and see how exceptional that really was. Um, I want to talk for just two seconds about cancer and how, um, how that was, that was um, I don't even know how to describe it. So the one thing that came to mind on this one was, was um, a lot of people talk about cancer consuming someone. And if you saw my mom in the last seven months, you, you would probably believe that. I mean, she physically changed um, and it was, it was really tough to see. What we saw as her kids and my dad saw as her spouse and those you know, close around her is that my mom may physically have been consumed by cancer, but my mom was being consumed by Jesus at the same time. And, um, and I'll tell you a quick story that just shows me the, the power of this. She, she was never angry. She never um, asked why. She just believed, right? And so um, in one of these moments, mom had gone to the hospital and uh, kind of cleaned the, the calcium out of her system. So she was very lucid for a, a, a period of time, as dad kind of noted on Caring Bridge. And I was pushing her in her wheelchair um, along her stretch of the greenway. I'd really miscalculated. I thought the sign was on one side. It was actually on the other side. So it was a two-mile walk there and back. And I was pushing her wheelchair. And I, I thought I'd be sweet. My mom and I, neither of us are like super sim- sentimental or sweet. And so I, I wanted to say something to my mom. And I said, hey, mom, I'm really going to miss you. And there was this kind of pregnant pause. And she says, well, I'm not really going to miss you. And, <laughs> and I said, and, and you know, and I, didn't quite know what to say. And she said, well, no, I don't want, I don't want you to take that the wrong way. I, I'm going to be in heaven. It's going to be different. And I was like, <laughs> you know what, mom, you were right. <laughs> um, and so that, you know, that moment more than anything else just solidified for me how she's handled this, which is that my mom, my mom's in heaven. She is, she is, and um, she is, and she believed that every minute, she believed that until the last moment, the last lucid day we got with her last Thursday, and she knew it, and we knew it, and we're so thankful for it. We're so thankful for it. So, um, whew. So, again, I tried to find a Bible verse to kind of sum all this up. My father-in-law asked me last night, he said, how do you, how do you knock this down into one thing? And I said, well, it's gotta be a Bible verse, obviously, because mom memorized so many. And, and, and this is the one that I think just nails it. So Philippians 1.21, this is Paul writing the, the verse, but I think my mom could have said this too. She said, this verse says, you know, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. We'll now invite up Tom Tillis to share his thoughts. Bobby, uh, probably one footnote. Um, you and David and Alex and Joy probably got bumped down one level after the bram- grandbabies come. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, we are here to mourn Ruth's death and her passage to heaven. But I'm here to celebrate it. I'm, I'm here to celebrate her life. Uh, she was a wonderful mother and grandmother friend, leader, wife, and she was amazing. I've heard these stories of a 30-year-old friend and the children, 
But I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the, the public figure that I was blessed to come to know. The first time I ever saw her was in 2005. She, was, uh, she was, had just lost the uh, at-large commissioner's race. And this was a couple of months later, and they were going around introducing some of the elected officials. And uh, she stood up and said, I'm Ruth Samuelson. I'm a commissioner in exile. <laughs> Everybody laughed and applauded her because we loved her. And she was already back serving her community just literally a couple of months after having lost a very tough election. The following year, we were both elected to the North Carolina House, and I see some of my other colleagues who were part of that class here today. And I had the honor of serving with her for eight years. She, uh, she was just this amazing person who could come, become friends with anybody. We became very, very close friends. We knew each other really in the context of public policy and community service. Um, we worked together for four years in the minority and then for four years in the majority in the leadership. And as Bobby said, the mentor, she was a mentor to me and she made me a much better leader. I hope I do better. I hope I, I do better than you. And you did extraordinary. Um, now, Ruth and I had very different styles. Um, many of you probably heard this, particularly if you walked the halls, but, uh, you know, she performed the flexible, the firm but flexible approach. And I kind of firm, uh, preferred the firm and not so flexible approach. <laughs> I see some nods over there with my fellow uh, members. She used to kid me by saying, you know, Tom, you're the steel hammer. And maybe every once in a while, you should think about being a velvet hammer. A hammer. And I would say, uh, yeah, no, Ruth, that's what we have you for. You know, she did so much, and she succeeded so well by the soft touch that she brought to everything that she did. I depended on her <clears throat> for some of the toughest things. She was truly a velvet hammer. <clears throat> Excuse me. In uh, Psalms 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Ruth had a strong heart, and she had boundless courage. Perhaps the best example of Ruth's courage was her leadership on protecting the lives of the unborn. Ruth led us through a process that showed respect for the opposing view, but literally has saved thousands of lives. I think it's particularly fitting today that there are hundreds of thousands of people up in D.C. celebrating in the March of Life, March for Life. And she'd probably be there if she wasn't already in heaven. But I know she can look down at those beautiful children and see the fruits of her courageous leadership. <clears throat> when I, uh, I heard about Ruth's illness, it was really difficult for me to grasp. Such a loving and dedicated person could be taken so soon. Susan and I have shed many tears as we've thought about her plight. But here's the amazing thing about Ruth again. We'd look on the post on Caring Bridge, and then I would call her from time to time. And the amazing thing about Ruth, and we've already heard it in the comments today, I would talk to her, how are you doing? I'm fine. And then she would go on to describe the treatments and the challenges that she was confronted with as if she was talking about her weekend plans. She was just amazing how she was so at peace with what God had uh, given her. And I believe it's because of her unwavering belief that God's plan for her preceded her time on earth and would transcend her brief time with us to eternal life with the Heavenly Father. She was simply waiting on the Lord. In Ecclesiastes 3, 4, Solomon wrote, There's a time for everything, a time to weep and a time to laugh. And I don't know, probably every single one of you, if you know Ruth, know that if you could tickle her funny bone, she could let out a laugh that was about as loud as anyone you could hear. And it was a wonderful thing to hear, and I heard it many times. Uh, she had a great sense of humor. <clears throat> she... Uh, 
demonstrated a number of times. One I thought about just a couple of, uh, about three weeks ago, I went and got a haircut. Ruth had this obsession with my uh, widow's pig. And she would never hesitate after I got a haircut that I may have been proud of, what's left of it. She would come up to me and say, the haircut looks good, but you have got to get rid of that widow's pig. I hate that widow's pig. She, I mean, literally, Susan even remembers. She asked her, she said, you remember? She just asked me this morning. I said, yeah. So about three weeks ago, I was at the barber shop getting my haircut, and all of a sudden, the barber just, barber just whacked straight through that widow's pig. And I, got, I immediately thought of Ruth. And I made today I shaved it, I made sure today I shaved it off because I know <laughs> up in heaven, she's looking down right now and saying, finally. <laughs> she, um, she'd also tell you, you know, what's on her mind at every step of the way. Um, there was another time, and actually it made me think about sharing it with you because of this picture of Ruth uh, here in the program. Pretty stern picture. I'm, uh, it's pretty good. guy. I, I probably would have to use a spreadsheet to count the number of times she's given me that look. <laughs> but there was one particular time on the Senate floor in 2011, we were doing the budget, and we were running all kinds of things, and everybody knows who was on the floor. She was running everywhere. I mean, she'd run up and down. She was whipping the boats, and she was doing everything she could to make sure that we got through the budget. And uh, all of a sudden, I could see she was serious. She was really in that tense mode, and I called her up to the dais with a serious look on my face, and I said, Ruth, she said, what? I said, you're running like a girl, because she was running around. The next week, she came into my office with a size pair, a size 11 pair of leopard high heel shoes, and she said, put these on and let's see how you run. <laughs> I could go on forever with her stories. She was a joy to be with. When I heard of Ruth's uh, condition had taken a turn, though, I was heartbroken. Uh, I really, like now, found it difficult to talk about. But I recall the post on Caring Bridge, her post, Ken's post, and I thought about their love for one another and their faith in God, and it's been a source of strength and comfort for me. Ken's love of Ruth and his faith of God is woven into every post and message and conversation I've had with him. I know his earthly heart is broken, but he has the joy of knowing that Ruth is now in heaven. Ken, thank you so much for being a source of strength and inspiration for all of us. <clears throat> Revelation, 14, 13, John wrote, Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor and their deeds will follow them. I'm going to miss Ruth so much. But her legacy will be remembered and her deeds will follow her into the kingdom of heaven. She had a positive impact on the lives of so many people who never had the privilege to know her. And she made so many of us better because we were blessed to be her friend. Ruth, God bless you. I'm going to miss you, and I love you. Now, Ken Samuelson. I just have to say, this seemed like a good idea to address you at the time. <laughs> I'm not really quite so sure now. For those of you who I haven't met, I'm Ken Samuelson, and I had the great pleasure of being married to Ruth, and I have a few comments. I may need to look down here so I don't cry looking at you guys. Margaret Thatcher was the iconic 
Prime Minister of Great Britain during the Reagan years. She was held in high esteem by all who knew her for her grace, power, and they called her the Iron Lady. In the article the Charlotte Observer published on Tuesday, they referred to Ruth as the Velvet Hammer. I've often said that I may be one of the few people who knows what it must have been like to be Dennis Thatcher. <laughs> Many wonderful things have been said about my dear sweet, uh, sweet wife Ruth, gosh, Connus, Bobby, extraordinary speeches. Tom, she touched your heart, I could tell. Uh, those things were said today, those things were said leading up to today. I can tell you with firsthand knowledge that all these wonderful things are absolutely true and descriptive of her. I would like to also say that I'm not an objective source. <laughs> Ruth and I were married in 1981 at Christ Episcopal Church just a few blocks from here. Some of you knew her then. She was fun, she was high-spirited, funny, and just plain smart. She was 21 years old when we were married. Back in those days, those wonderful traits came also like software bundled with her being combative, defensive, edgy, tough, and sometimes just a little bit hard to be around. <laughs> I always love being around her though. During those 35 years we were married, I got to see firsthand how God honed and shaped her into the woman that we all know and love today and have come here today to celebrate. You now know her as someone who was easy to be around, an encourager, filled with kindness, very other-centered, and still just plain smart. So you might be wondering, how did that happen? How did she go from being a little difficult to be, to be around to being someone who was filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control? Well, first of all, I was only an observer in the process. It was God who did all the work on her heart, and Ruth was a willing participant. This has been mentioned before, but if I had one thing to point to that was instrumental in the process, it was her commitment to memorize Scripture. My notes say most of you don't know this. Now most of you know this because everybody said it. She's memorized. She literally did memorize 650 passages of Scripture. And when I say, most people say they know it, and they kind of vaguely recommend recollect that she had stone-cold memorization with references. Those were occasionally used on me. <laughs> Those truths sat in her mind, and God used them to shape her into the beautiful person that we all loved and are here today to celebrate, and it was a remarkable process. The Scripture influenced how she thought about everything, and I mean everything. It even shaped how she, was, how she responded when she was told of her fatal diagnosis on May 27th of last year, exactly eight months ago to this day. I was with her on that day when she received that news. Ruth started keeping a journal about 25 years ago. Early on, I, she asked that I never read the journals until after she was gone. Now, if you think about it, I always thought I would die before her. We kind of make that assumption if we're guys. And she has tremendous longevity in her family, and I literally never touched the journals. Not a fingerprint. Never touched them. Never opened I had no idea what she was writing. She wrote in it virtually every day before she turned the light off. In her final hours, as she laid on a her bed completely unconscious, and as I sat beside her, I decided to go to the, back to the bedroom and pick up the current journal book that she was keeping and read a few entries. I gotta tell you, I felt a little bit guilty because she was still here. <laughs> but I was glad I did it. It was a way for her to talk to me and let me know what she was thinking when she was unable to speak or even gesture. And as I read those journal's entries for the very first time, what I realized was that she was keeping a daily love letter to God filled with gratitude and hope in all the entries. It was beautiful. It was stunning and so conversational. She was talking to her good friend. As I thumbed through the entries, I swallowed hard and decided to turn to the entry for May 27th, the day of her terminal diagnosis. This is her journal book, and this is her entry for that day. Now, this is going to be a little hard. 
It's dated May 27th. We had just come back from the doctor that day, and she was laying in bed doing her journal entry. I'm kind of wondering what she's writing, but I promise you I didn't look then. I was really glad to see it now. She said, Lord, it's been a while since, we, since I wrote. she had been a few days, but that doesn't mean we haven't been in communication. The CT scan yesterday was very different than I expected. Two lumps the size of tennis balls, one around the uterus and the other on the liver. Thank you for, pr for prompting Dr. Mueller, our regular doctor, to order it and for the res results coming so quickly and for Yavorsky, her regular GYN, being available and responsive, for her getting me an oncology appointment today and for Ken getting through the terrible weather to make it home last night. I know you love us and have a plan. Be my hope, my comforter, and my great physician. That's the end of the entry. What was striking to me was not only the beauty of what was there, but what was not there. There was no bitterness, there was no questioning, there was no uncertainty, there was no anger, there was no pity. Only gratitude and confidence that God would be her hope, comforter, and great physician. Ruth uh, left the legislature in 2014 at the apex of her experience and influence. She was one of the highest ranking Republican women in our state, but in many ways, she was an enigma to both Republicans and Democrats. If you did not take time to get to know her, it was hard to understand what motivated her and why she did what she did. As has been mentioned, Ruth loved hymns, and she quoted her favorite hymn in her final speech to the North Carolina House on the day of her departure. The title of the hymn is, In Christ Alone, and these are the words she quoted to finish her final address. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Ruth, honey, rest sweetly, my love, until I see you again. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Ken. We now have an opportunity to sing those very words. Let us continue to worship.
One last text this afternoon. As Pastor Dave Culp said, Ruth had planned out her service, and this text she assigned to me. <laughs> Matthew chapter 25, verse 20. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents, here I've made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Death is hard for us. In a sense, it is meant to be. And so I marvel that the Apostle Paul would ever write those words that we heard read from 1 Corinthians earlier, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Because at a moment like this, we feel the sting of death. It seems to us to have won a victory over our beloved Ruth. But that passage has an introduction that tells us something about the timing of the promise. It says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Our Lord Jesus Christ has indeed conquered death. And through her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Ruth has as well in him. But we do not experience it, we do not feel it, we do not know it until we have passed through the veil of death ourselves. And there on the other side are greeted by our Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us that we must pass through the veil of death if Jesus tarries. That our bodies are not suited for heaven. Again from 1 Corinthians 15, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We have to pass through the veil of death and put on the imperishable provided for us by the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who pass through death with Jesus, they have this promise. The promise that Ruth has asked us to consider today. That as we pass through in faith and we meet the Lord Jesus Christ, he will say to each one of us, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, I will set you over much Enter into the joy of your master. We have this assurance from our Lord Jesus Christ that we will live with him forever. Death, as frightening as it is for us, as painful as it is for us to experience the death of our loved ones, is not final. It is not victorious. There's an eternity with Jesus. One of the most assuring texts One of the most assuring quotes from our Lord Jesus that we've read already from John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Christ has prepared a place for his people. For those who have faith in Jesus Christ, there is absolutely no reason to fear death. For we know that he will come and take us to be with him. And we will hear that, well done, good and faithful servant. 
But who goes to heaven and who hears that from the Lord Jesus Christ, well done, good and faithful servant? When you first read this text, you might think, well, it seems clear that you earn it by being a faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. It seems to be there, doesn't it? You were faithful. You did good with a little bit, so you'll get even more. But our Lord Jesus Christ was very clear about this. We do not earn heaven. We cannot work our way there at all. When we take another look at this parable that Ruth has chosen for us to look at today, we see something else besides the faithfulness of the steward. We see faith in the steward. It becomes more evident when we think back to the unfaithful, the unprofitable servant, just a few verses back. Excuse me, a few verses forward, verse 24. He said, it says of him, he also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. In the unfaithful, the unprofitable steward, we see this very clearly, that steward lacked faith in the master. He did not believe that he was kind and gracious and would reward him. He feared him. He did not love him. But the faithful servant, the faithful steward, believed in him, trusted him, loved him, knew that he would reward him. It was faith in his master that made him faithful in service to his master. Hebrews 11, without faith it is impossible to please him. Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. The faithful servant believed. He believed his master existed. He believed his master would reward him and reward him generously. Understand from the text that the reward is all out of proportion with the service that was rendered. The master says, you've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much because the reward is a matter of grace. Grace rewarding faith. Will Ruth Samuelson receive a reward? Is she today set over much? Absolutely. <laughs> no question about it. You've heard ample testimony from those who know her from those who have worked with her, to those who have lived with her from the very first day of their lives, to her husband's testimony, to her best friend's testimony, that she was faithful. Faithful as a, a wife and a mother and a friend, a servant in the city, a servant in her church. Everything she did, everywhere she went, she was faithful. Uh, Ruth reminds me of what it was said about the Lord Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 10. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. She went around doing good everywhere she possibly could and healing those who were oppressed by the devil through the proclamation of the word of God. Ruth has heard, well done, good and faithful servant. It would be so easy to stop there, to leave the text there, but we would not do it justice because there's more nuance, more complexity and far more glory for our Lord if we understand exactly what is happening. For Ruth did not hear well done from Jesus because she earned it. She heard well done from Jesus because she believed him. She believed him. She was a faithful servant because she was a faith-filled servant. That word faithful in the text could well be translated believing as well. You could say well done, good and believing servant. Ruth believed the Lord. And we've heard testimony of that. The over 600 verses that she memorized, but it was not just the memory work that went into it. It was the passion. She believed every word that came from the mouth of the Lord. Every word. Where her life did not measure up to the word of God, she sought by the grace of God to be changed. And we have heard testimony of that from her husband. In those early days, maybe not so pleasant to live with but we saw her change, losing none of her zeal, but she softened by the Spirit of God. 
She changed in a way that was even more glorious. This was Christ at work in her heart. Ruth was faith-filled. She believed in Jesus. She believed that he was God and he was man. That he'd come to earth with a simple purpose that was to save us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have life eternal. She believed every word and she lived by it. So believing him and loving him, she sought to serve him every day of her life. It was her faith in Jesus, her her love for Jesus, her desire to serve him that got Ruth up in the morning, that got her through the day in such powerful service, that tucked her in again at night. She bet her entire life. She wagered everything she was and did and had on the veracity of the word of God in her service, public and private, It was her faith in Jesus that made her such a servant in this world. So dogged, so determined, yet willing to listen. One of her mottos, reflect Christ. Ruth lived with absolute certainty in the word of God. That every word Jesus said is true. Not just a little true, or sometimes true, but always true all the time truth you can live by, she bet her entire life on it. She believed that when Jesus said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to be to myself, where, that where I am you may be also. She believed that he actually literally meant that and that on his way through town on Monday, she would st- he would stop at her home and pick her up and take her to be with him in heaven, and he has. She believed, imperfectly as we all must, but sincerely, that Christ is Savior. That he meant what he said, that those who serve him, believing in him, will be rewarded in the life to come. It was one of our other mottos, pack light. She knew, however, that her heavenly reward could not come by her own efforts. She knew she could never earn or deserve heaven for even the very best of her good work. She was far too good a theologian. I know I've been her pastor for 20 years, far too good a theologian to ever think that. She knew that her first and most important work was to believe. Jesus was asked, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answers them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. She knew that she could not earn heaven. She knew she could not earn the reward of heaven, but that it had been earned for her already by the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life as a ransom for for us. Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God, that Jesus calls us to believe on him and that believing by faith in him, we have the inheritance of eternal life. Our Lord Jesus in John 5, truly, truly I say to you, whoever hears my word, and believes him who sent me has eternal life, and that in him we do find life. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Ultimately, Ruth heard, well done, good and faithful servant, because the Lord Jesus Christ was a faithful servant, giving his life as a ransom for many, giving his life as a ransom for Ruth. It was faith, belief in Jesus that fueled Ruth's life. She did not serve and work as hard as she did, hoping somehow to obtain heaven by her her efforts. From the very first day she walked with Jesus Christ, she knew heaven was secure for her, that she would hear that from her master, well done, good and faithful servant. So she spent her life serving diligently, knowing what waited. Well done, Ruth. She didn't try to earn his approval because she knew she could not, because she had already had it through the work of Jesus Christ. She was absolutely certain that Jesus had earned it and offered it to her. She didn't think she deserved heaven, Galatians 2.16. We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ And not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. 
She knew we must know that we can never serve enough to earn heaven. We can never serve perfectly enough to deserve that well done, good and faithful servant. It must come by grace. On this point, Mark Twain was right. He said, heaven goes by favor. If it went by merit, you would stay out and your dog would go in. <laughs> we cannot earn heaven. Ruth absolutely knew that. There was no doubt in her mind. The wages of sin is death, scripture tells it, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Rightly believing that heaven was hers already, she served. Knowing what was waiting for her, she was happy to serve, knowing that Christ had earned it. Ruth not only believed Jesus earned her heaven, she bet her entire life on it. With all the recognition and honor that this world has lavished on her, with the financial reward that she and her husband have experienced, she could have had so much more easily. She could have parlayed her position and influence into greater wealth and ease and notoriety for herself. She and Ken could have spent it all on themselves rather than giving it away and living on a fraction, a small fraction of all that they were ever given. Why? Why did she do it? Why did they give away so much? Why did she give up so much and serve so much? Why? Because she believed absolutely in what Jesus Christ said. That the day would come that she would be with him and she would hear that well done, good and faithful service based on his grace and his goodness. And she would enter the joy of heaven and there's nothing on world, in this world that could possibly touch it. Pack light. That was her absolute faith. Hebrews 11. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Ruth has now received that heavenly reward. Her lifelong wager to believe in Jesus has paid off. But don't you think for a minute that Ruth is dead? She has died, yes, gone through the veil, but through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the perishable has put on the imperishable. She stands with Jesus now, whom, as her son Bobby said, she did love even more than her husband. And she's entered that celestial city whose architect and builder is God. As others have noticed, Ruth has not left the land of the living to go to the land of the dead, not at all. She has left the land of the dying, where we are, to go to the land of those who live for eternity. And she has heard those words from Jesus. Enter into the joy of your master. She is a place where there's no more pain. Scripture describes it this way, Revelation 7, therefore there before the throne of God and serve him day and night in the temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more neither thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Ruth is alive and well, enjoying the presence of her beloved Lord Jesus. If you're here today because you love Ruth, you want to honor her, that's a very good thing. Thank you for being here. But don't, do, do not leave here looking at her life and think, if I could just work as hard as Ruth, if I could do as much as her, maybe somehow I too could hear that well done, good and faithful servant. If you want to learn from the life of Ruth Samuelson, learn this, the righteous will live by faith. Emulate her faith. 
embrace her Lord Jesus Christ, come to the same assurance that she had that heaven was a gift awaiting her, well done, awaited her, and then you will be able to serve in the world as she did. And you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. For all who come to Jesus in faith, life ends that way. Life in this world, as we pass through the veil, ends that way and we go to a better place with him. Jesus, who came through death, absolutely assured us of that. The book of Revelation, chapter 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be them, with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Ruth Colbertson Samuel Samuelson, beloved wife, mother, sister, daughter, grandmother, friend, has seen the Lord Jesus Christ and has heard from him those words we long to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. She has heard them because she is filled with faith in Jesus. Few of us in this room, I suppose, could do half of what Ruth has done. But anyone here, anyone here could believe as she has believed on her Lord Jesus Christ. And if you do, you too will hear those words from him. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Amen. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for the joy of these years with your daughter, Ruth. What a blessing she has been to every life she has touched because you touched her life. We thank you that that faith-filled life is today rewarded by you, our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you would move even now in the hearts of those who here today yet fear death, that they may have the same confidence that Ruth had, the same courage with which she faced death, knowing without any doubt that her Lord awaited her. Lord, may we all hear from our faith in you those words, well done. We ask in your name, Jesus. Amen.
On behalf of the families, I want to thank you again for coming today. There will be a reception immediately following the service. You can get there by exiting the back doors, taking a left, and you'll find the fellowship hall down on the left. Now receive this benediction from the Lord. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.